Hi, welcome to another podcast of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. The Global Network was created in 1992 to protect, uh, to prevent rather, the arms race from moving into space. Support the show by clicking on the like button and subscribing to our YouTube channel and check out our website, spaceforpeace.org. We thank Global Network board member, Will Griffin, for doing the tech work to make this show possible. Our guest this time is Tamara Lorenz from Canada. She's a board member of the Global Network. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Bruce, for having me. We'd like you to take just a moment and briefly introduce yourself uh, to the audience. So I am a longtime peace activist, feminist, and environmentalist. I am active with the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom Canada. And not only am I a peace activist, but I am also an academic, and I am doing my PhD at the Balsillie School of International Affairs at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, Ontario. And my research is on the climate and environmental impacts of the military. And Bruce, as part of my introduction, it's important for me to say uh, uh, on this topic of uh, disinformation that we are going to be engaging in that I and working on my sixth university degree. So I have five other degrees from uh, four other institutions, and I care very much about the university as an important space and uh, for critical inquiry, uh, for debate, and for dialogue. And, and what I've discovered at the university has really troubled me. So I'm really glad we're having this conversation today. All right, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to it as well. So we're gonna have you talk about this very important subject that you're calling, quote, the disinformation project, how universities are partnering with NATO and the state to suppress dissent, unquote. So you're gonna begin with a 15 minute fascinating PowerPoint presentation, and then we'll use the rest of the show to discuss your important research. So go ahead, take it away. Great, I'll just share my slides right now. So I have discovered the existence of a very insidious NATO National Intelligence Services academic network to control information on social media and on campuses in Canada. The scale and scope of this network is extremely troubling and what is happening in uh, in Canada is also happening in the United States and in Europe. And it is an information operation that is carefully coordinated by the US government, by NATO and the European Union. And it is a partnership with social media and with academia. And it has been developing over the past decade and it has been deployed to deal with this terrible war in Ukraine. So after Russia invaded Ukraine or started its special military operation last February, I noticed that the Canadian government was very active on social media, promoting this idea that the war in Ukraine was unprovoked. So you can see this tweet from the Canadian government. It says, stand with Ukraine, stop the lies, and learn more about Canada's efforts to counter disinformation. I also became concerned uh, that there was no uh, open debate about the war in Ukraine at the university, no professor, no one was criticizing what Canada and NATO were doing in Ukraine, and there wasn't any event or professor, you know, calling for peace. There was this very strange silencing at the universities in Canada, and even professors with tenure weren't speaking out. However, there was one major event that was held for Ukraine. A year ago, last June, 10 universities in Canada did a big joint live stream of President Z Zelensky speaking remotely to Canadian students across the country. Zelensky told students that they should call on their elected officials to support more weapons and stand with Ukraine. And Canada's Deputy Prime Minister, Christia Freeland, introduced Zelensky and she praised the fact that the federal government had spent over a billion dollars in military and economic aid to Ukraine. And I was at the event at the University of Waterloo, which 
uh, jointly runs the Balsillie School of International Affairs, Wilfrid Laurier University. So it was a joint event. And I protested with my sign, stop the war, stop NATO, peace in Ukraine, peace with Russia. And I received a backlash in the media and at my university. And my pe perspective of peace was very uh, heavily criticized. And I was called a Putin propagandist. I had to depend, d defend my position of peace to the director. And I made two formal requests to my university to respect a diversity of views. And I argued that the university should be a, a place of critical inquiry, critical thinking, and we should be having debates about the the war and that the university should be the place where we're trying to be to find constructive ways to end the war and to promote peace. But that's not happening. That same month that Zelensky spoke to students last June, the University of Calgary released a report entitled Disinformation and the Russia-Ukrainian War on Canadian Social Media. Um, and let me explain uh, uh, for a moment, uh, just pause here and define what is disinformation. So it is understood as verifiably false or misleading information that is created and just disseminated to intentionally deceive the public and it may cause public harm and it is a threat to democracy and security. So my positions were considered disinformation. And this University of Calgary report claimed that the disinformation that is these pro-Russian narratives, such as NATO expansion is uh, the cause of the conflict and NATO is an aggressor and Ukraine is a fascist state, is coming from Russian-influenced accounts, from people like Ben Norton, Aaron Maté, Max Blumenthal, and John Pilger. But, you know, we know that these people are not Russian-influenced uh, people, but they are credible, serious journalists who are critical of U.S. foreign policy. And I informed these journalists about this University of Calgary report. I also contacted the University of Calgary and I told them that I didn't agree with their findings and I questioned where the money came for this report, but they didn't reply. However, I discovered that the lead author of the report, Professor Jean-Christophe Boucher receives hundreds of thousands of dollars of research funding from the Department of National Defense in Canada. And this report received wide media coverages in newspapers across the country and in the tele across the television. And in March of this year, another report came out called The Enemy of My Enemy, Russian Weaponization of Canada's Far Right and Far Left to undermine support for Ukraine. And this report was done by the University of Regina, the University of Toronto's Digital Public Square, and the University of Maryland. And this report claims that, that Russia is influencing social media. The authors say that Russian disinformation is targeting Canadians through an engagement of 200,000 accounts on Twitter, but they don't provide any specific examples of these Twitter accounts or any concrete evidence. Yet the authors say that Russia is promoting these false narratives. NATO is responsible for the war, Ukraine is, is corrupt and doesn't deserve our support, and if Canadians want to cooperate with Russia on climate and Arctic issues, then we must return to diplomacy. Now remember, these narratives, the report claims are Russian disinformation, but we could actually make a, a, a very credible case that these are important, um, legitimate messages. So the University of Regina in this report also cites that previous University of Calgary report. So you can see that there is an echo chamber being uh, created. And um, this enemy of my enemy report, again, got widely covered in the media, and it even got a big article in the New York Times. But this media coverage failed to point out that the main funders of this report were Canada's Department of National Defense and the U.S. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA. As well, one of the key authors of this report is Marcus Kolga, and he is with the McDonald Laurier Institute. He's a senior researcher, and at the MLI Institute, which is a conservative pro-NATO corporate think tank, he 
created a, a program called Disinfo Watch. And Colga's Disinfo Watch is funded by, note this carefully on the slide, by the U.S. Embassy in Canada, NATO Strategic Communications in Latvia, the EU versus disinformation in Brussels, and the U.S. State Department's Global Engagement Center. Now, remember uh, that uh, center that I just said. Then, last month, Marcus Kolga presented his report, The Enemy of My Enemy, at this two-day conference that was held at the University of Waterloo, which is also one of my uh, universities, called The Weaponization of Disinformation in Canada. And the conference was attended by academics across the country, representatives of think tanks, and government officials. And uh, at this conference, you know, they were identifying Russia, China, and Iran as the key disseminators of disinformation in the country. But there was no debate about the substance of the issues. They were just saying that these countries are are spreading false narratives. And it's these these professors and representatives of think tanks and government officials that were taking the authority themselves to say what is legitimate information and what is disinformation. And at this conference, they were also giving policy options to control information. And they said that we need a whole of government and a whole of society approach. Now, after attending this two-day conference, I became even more worried and I and started to investigate further. And I discovered that in 2009, Canada's Security Intelligence Service, CSIS, established an academic outreach and stakeholder engagement process. CSIS is Canada's equivalent to the CIA and um, is the, the connection to the Five Eyes Alliance with the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand. And over the past 10 years, through this academic outreach program, CSIS has been holding workshops with professors on different topics, but CSIS will not reveal the pre professors who are attending these workshops. In 2018, CSIS held a workshop with academics across the country entitled who said what the security challenges of modern disinformation and most of the topics that are in this 100 page report are related to russia china and iran and never once it, uh, in any of these workshops or reports or at this two-day conference that i attended at the university of waterloo do they ever uh, look at uh, the, the 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 false and mis uh, false information and misinformation that our own governments, Canada and the United States, are perpetuating and and disseminating. So, what CSIS is doing through this academic outreach program is to control and limit academic discourse. And in my opinion, this is what explains the strange self censorship of academics and universities in Canada. But it relates to a much bigger problem that was revealed by journalists Matt Taibbi and Michael Schellenberg in their reporting on the Twitter files, because it very much implicates social media. When Elon Musk took over Twitter last year, he gave Taibbi and Schellenberg and other journalists access to the internal communication and document uh, documents about the operations of Twitter. And these documents revealed that the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, and the CIA had infiltrated these social media platforms like Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and were controlling the content. On March 9th, Taibbi and Schellenberg were invited to testify at a congressional hearing put on by the Judiciary Committee's Select Committee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government. The Republicans called this committee because they were concerned that the social um, that their social media accounts were being uh, controlled. And in their testimony, Taibbi and Schellenberg explained that they were journalists, they were nonpartisan, uh, but that these security agencies were pressuring social media accounts to kick people off their platforms, to amplify the accounts that were favorable to the government, and to de-amplify the accounts that were critical of the government. Taibbi and Schellenberg described it as a censorship industrial complex. 
between the state and big tech to control information that the public could see and share, and that this complex was a threat to the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution and to democracy itself. Taibbi and Schellenberg's testimonies are really very important, and I urge people to watch or read them online, because the mainstream media did not adequately cover this really important hearing. Taibbi also identified that the uh, the role of the U.S. State Department's Global Engagement Center as a key driver for the censorship industrial complex. The GEC was started by the Obama administration in 2011, and its mission is to recognize and counter foreign state and non-state propaganda and disinformation aimed at undermining or influencing the policies, security, and stability of the United States, its allies, and partner nations. The GEC is the central node of this complex. However, one important connection to this complex that Taibbi and Schellenberg didn't mention was academia, and I see it playing out at my university. But last year, Stanford University held a symposium entitled Challenges to Disinform... Uh, to challenges to democracy in the digital information realm. The academic who put on the symposium was Professor Michael McFall, who was the former ambassador to Russia and who has been pushing for more weapons to Ukraine to defeat Russia. And he, of course, has been very active on social media. McFall arranged for his former boss, President Obama, to give the keynote uh, speech. And in his address, Obama attacked uh, Russia and China for spreading disinformation, and he talked about the need to control information and how the U.S. and European Union were introducing new legislation. So finally, this disinformation project is part of an information war. Our governments and intelligence services are coordinating with NATO, social media companies, and universities to limit political dis discourse, suppress dissent, and it is a war that is directed against us. It's neo-McCarthyism and it's authoritarian. The problem is at the universities and the universities are part of the problem. Now, imprisoned WikiLeaks journalist Julian Assange said, democracy is free speech and dissent. This disinformation project is antithetical to that. And I think what we need to do is expose this challenge this, use social media and other venues to spread our information, to expose the threat that NATO is, and to promote peace and cooperation with Russia and China. Thank you. Wow. Sorry to make you have to go so short and so fast. I bet you could go on for hours with this incredibly important, important uh, piece of work. Thank you so much, Tamara. I got three questions for you. First, why are so many Western academic institutions falling in line with this subversion of democratic debate? There are a couple of reasons. One of the prime reasons is because they are getting so much money from, from the feder federal government. So in Canada, what happened was in 2017, when the Trudeau government released their new defense policy called Strong, Secure, and Engaged, they released a, a, a launched new funding programs through the Department of National Defense called the Minds Program and the Ideas Program. And there, academics and universities could apply for millions of dollars of funding to support pro-military, pro-NATO research. Now, this Minds and Ideas program is a 20-year program that has $1.6 billion allocated uh, to it. So over over the next two decades, the federal government is going to be giving approximately $80 million to universities you know, for this kind of research. And it's the Department of National Defense that receives these applications from university professors, uh, says which is going to get funding, which isn't. And of course, all of the uh, research projects that are that are in line with the federal government and national defense uh, perspectives 
are, is what's getting funded. So you can see that the professors become dependent on this funding. The other thing is there is no uh, research body in Canada or foundation or the federal government is not providing any funding for peace research. Uh, as well, I believe that there is gatekeeping going on at the universities. I think that universities are only hiring academics that that are very supportive of you know of of the government of the military of nato as well there's another uh, aspect to this and the universities are very concerned about their graduates getting jobs and they really uh, want like at a program at my university the master's students to be able to work uh with the, the federal government in the Department of Foreign Affairs or the Department of National Defense, even CSIS is recruiting on campus. And so the universities don't want to criticize what the federal government is doing because they want to ensure that that their students, you know, can get jobs in the federal government and that this money keeps flowing. You know, in 2014, after the U.S. orchestrated coup d'etat in Ukraine that imposed essentially the muscle-backed, uh, Nazi-backed, uh, right-wing uh, government. I started tracking people that I found on Facebook that were supportive of it. And what it, what it led to, I worked on it for about a week, just following, you know, going down the rat hole, following the trail. And what I found was people that worked for NGOs, uh, on the coup, were funded by George Soros, by uh, National Endowment for Democracy, St U.S. State Department, various European uh, foundations too that were allied uh, right wing. Uh, and then I let that trail led me to universities in the United States, polit especially political science departments that are facing state level cutbacks. You know, we're talking about university of this state or university of that state. They're having the states are in a fiscal crisis, so they're cutting back. And so these departments then have to turn to other sources for funding, right? To run their program. And so who pays the, uh, the freight uh, decides what the train schedule is gonna be. And so what I found was that George Soros and again, these other kind of sources were funding these academics. And then I began looking at what were these academics writing about this coup and about the, you know, the situation in Ukraine uh, soon after 2014. And what I found was they were largely, not always, but largely supporting the Western line. And so this really uh, is a thorough infiltration, if you will, of academia. My next uh, question for you. Absolutely. Yeah, sorry. Do you want to comment on that? Anymore? Well, just to say, then what academia is doing is turning around and giving its uh, legitimacy to, to, to all of this. So, you know, we rely as a public on the university to be doing good research, right? To be doing investigation, to be, you know, to be objective, to try to you know, do research to explore all the facts and to to help us make sense of things. But instead, it's just becoming an echo chamber, and and it and even worse, it's it's giving its uh, veneer of legitimacy and credibility to the re these reports that couldn't even be peer reviewed because they're not be they're not even revealing specific facts, uh, yeah. facts and data. Well, let's go to my second question. So. Uh, you're a longtime peace activist in Canada, and how how are peace people in general across Canada that you know and that you've worked with over the years? How are they responding to your research? Well, the peace community in Canada uh, is 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 very supportive of the work that I'm doing to try to you know bring in facts. Uh, uh, about what is, uh, you know, going on with this horrible war in Ukraine, NATO's role, the Canadian government's role. And, you know, for me as, as a peace activist, you know, like I said, you know, I'm also an academic. And for me, it's really important to have evidence-based 
research. So I do a lot of digging to look at source material. Um, I was just yesterday at the Canadian Forces uh, Library, and I have more documents uh, that shows, you know, NATO has been working on this campaign in uh, against Russia, you know, to destabilize Ukraine for the past 20 years. And so for me, it's really important to have facts. So I have a lot of support. But the thing that's been pro a problem is that the peace community, we haven't been able to, to get space very easily to have public meetings about our concerns about Canada's and NATO's role in this in this war. So I gave a talk, for instance, in in Ottawa in January, one at the University of uh of Carleton and uh, at a at a community center in the capital and and at both times uh, Ukrainian students who are aligned with the ult with ultranationalism uh, you know tried to deplatform us they tried to uh, cause our our events to be shut down and other peace activists like Eve Engler, a great author and activist in Montreal, he has been deplatformed and not able to to speak about the great research and writings that he's been doing about this war. So uh, it's been hard for us to get space. It's hard for us to, to get a hearing on campus and um, and e even to get published in the media. We've also, we're also being completely ignored by mainstream media. We've sent out press releases about our concerns, about our actions and rallies. They never get covered hardly by the media. Instead, if it, anything is ever covered, we're vilified and we're, uh, you know, we're attacked in the media. All right. It's, uh, it's a hell of a story. And I think it's it's the same story for in general in the United States and throughout uh, Western Europe as well. Finally, my last question. Is this repression of information and debate actually a sign of U.S., U.K., Canada, and the rest of NATO's desperation to beat back the coming multipolar world. Because, you know, what we're seeing here is the West, 500 years of colonization and imperialism around the world. The global South essentially standing behind Russia and China today want a multipolar world rather than this Western unipolar world. And I think the West is feeling massive desperation. And so they've got to suppress their own uh, constituencies, their own citizens, so that they can arm up in order to put a loaded gun to the head of Russia and China and any other players out there from the global south that think they can stand up to this Western imperialism. Would you comment on that, please? Yes, I agree with you, Bruce. And the NATO and you know these these western governments realize that they can't easily control social media they right it's very hard for them to uh, to 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 stop the public from from sharing information on the different platforms because you know, they've already co-opted, they've already constrained mainstream media, right? Uh, the, the, the media, mainstream media in the US, the UK, Canada is, is the same. But social media, they're having more difficulty controlling. And so this is the, this is the area that they're, that they're really targeting. And this is why they're using this particular phrase of disinformation, because what they're doing is, people like myself or like you that are using our social media accounts to say, hey, you know, NATO really provoked this war. NATO is prolonging this war. We need peace with Russia and China. We need to cooperate with these countries on our on our global challenges. You know, let's have a positive multipolar world. They're calling people like us and our messages disinformation to try to suppress and repress us. This is why it's important for us to expose this to demand transparency, demand, find out who is, 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 you know, is funding things that we think is, is strange. And, um, and then to, to help each other spread our messages on social media and out in the public. Yeah. Um, and so we need to support each other.
Thank you. Well, Tamara, thank you so much. Uh, you will continue this discussion uh, in the Global Network's 31st annual meeting that we're going to do online, a Zoom panel discussion. You'll be one of the panelists. It's July 15th. If you go to our website and look in our events section at spaceforpeace.org, you can find the registration link for that Zoom conference. So you'll continue at that time this discussion. Uh, thanks again for everything and know that you're not alone out there. And thank you for watching another edition of Space Alert. We'll do another show, show soon with a different uh, movement leader from a, a different country, different part of the world. Until then, good luck to you all and please get organized. <laughs>